So what I want to do here is try my hand at running over DC's flashpoint event. And what I want to do is instead of simply just covering the story, I want to, uh, I want to get a little more meat and potatoes out of this. And the reason why I say that is yes, flashpoint was a story that was used by DC to launch the new 52, but a flashpoint was in and of itself, its own cohesive universe. It had its own backstories for a majority of the characters. It was very self-contained. Uh, of course it was a universe that ceased to exist with the launch of the new 52, but it was still, you know, it still had its own history and the characters had been shaken up in a lot of ways that made them really intriguing from what we normally saw. And so what I want to do is I want to kick all this off with the story of whatever happened to Bruce Bruce Wayne. Now, to provide some context to this, uh, I want to get into, you know, Flash, uh, Flashpoint issue number one. And what happens is we basically pick up with the character of Barry Allen. Now, the reason why Flashpoint is such a big deal, the reason why it's so important is this was really like the conclusion of Jeff John's view of Barry Allen. And the reason why I say that is throughout Barry Allen's entire history in DC Comics, you know, before Crisis on Infinite Earths, when he died during Crisis on Infinite Earths, and when he came back during the events of Final Crisis, the one common theme in his life was his mother. Mother Nora Allen. It was the 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 common thread. If there was any one thing that he always wished always wished he could do, it was go back and save his mother's life. But it was something that he never did because he knew that messing with the timeline would have caused problems. Basically, Jeff Johns came back with Flash Rebirth, not the uh, 2016 DC Rebirth, but the original Flash Rebirth, which we turned, or I guess told the story of Barry Allen's return to the DC landscape. And Jeff Johns retconned a lot of things. One of the most notable things that he retconned was the character of Eobard Thawne. If any of you guys have been watching the Flash TV. TV show, and if you were watching the first uh, the first season, Eobar Thawne played a villain who came from the future and traveled into the past uh, for the purpose of going crazy and kind of killing Barry. But he was also his mentor. And the reason for that was within the comics themselves, Eobard Thawne had become obsessed with Barry Allen. He actually went as far as to make himself look like Barry Allen. And his goal was to basically be Barry Allen. But when he traveled into the past to meet Barry Allen for the first time, uh, when he realized that he had arrived after Crisis on Infinite Earths was over and Barry Allen was dead, it had driven into insanity. This was the same, this was uh, basically compounded by the fact that Eobard Thawne, after going to a museum, learned that he would be Barry Allen's worst enemy. Enemy. And so instead of being, you know, uh, I guess fighting alongside his idol, alongside his hero, learning that he would become the worst villain of Barry Allen drove him insane. And the result was that under Jeff John's retcon, which is a retroactive continuity, that's where writers go in and change the status quo of comic books, Jeff John's came in and said that not only had Eobard Thawne traveled into the past to meet Barry Allen, but once he became a villain, once he accepted his role as being a bad guy, he had basically engineered the circumstances of Barry Allen becoming the Flash. He was the reason why Barry Allen's family had moved in the first place. He was the reason why Barry Allen had been struck by chemical, I guess uh, had been doused in a certain mixture of chemicals and struck by lightning when he originally got his powers. And the most significant thing is Eobard Thawne was the one that killed Barry Allen's mother. Now the reason why this matters is because as we go over the course of this Flashpoint series, we'll learn that Eobard Thawne was kind of anchored. You know, if we looked at, um, at Barry Allen as, you know, a ship, that Eobard Thawne was the anchor attached to the ship. The, the chain basically being the timeline of Eobard Thawne's life. In order for Eobard Thawne to become the reverse Flash, Barry Allen had to become the Flash in order for Eobard Thawne to want to become Flash in the first place. And so Barry, like Eobard Thawne going into the past and making these changes was done to ensure that he would come into existence. Now this is something I'd like you to keep in the back of your head because I know it sounds a little weird, but it'll all make sense once we actually start getting headlong into the main Flashpoint event. But picking up with this, uh, of course, we're just kind of given, you know, a little bit of the rundown on Barry Allen's life, we're kind of given a refresher basically by Jeff Johns. You know, he talks uh, talks to us about how Barry Allen found love, you know, about how he was able to make a life of it for his own. He was able to fight along the Flash family, of course, Jesse Quick, Max Mercury, Jay Garrick, so on and so forth, Wally West. You know, he fought alongside some of the mightiest superheroes on the planet Earth. And it's just giving us context into who he is or who he's been up to this point. And what happens is we switch to Barry Allen waking up, you know, in the middle of an office building. Now, this is not uncommon. Uh, this is basically Jeff Johns kind of uh, kind of, you know, pulling a, a, a prank on us, so to speak, or kind of yanking the floor out from under us. And the reason why I say that is, you know, Barry Allen wouldn't be a slacker by your standards of measurement, but because of the fact that he is a superhero, because he runs around, because he has so much going on, it wouldn't hurt to believe that he would have to catch a break, you know, every once in a while. And this is what happens. Of course, his supervisor comes in and his supervisor, you know, is, is disciplining him a little bit. But Barry Allen also hears that the villain, Captain Cold, uh, is running amok. Now, something I want you to take note of here is they do not call him Captain Cold 
Cold, they call him Citizen Cold. And as soon as Barry hears the name Citizen Cold, uh, he learns that Captain Cold is basically a hero in this reality as opposed to being one of his most formidable villains. And so because of this, you know, Barry is thinking that maybe, you know, he's, he's part of the rogues. No one knows who the rogues are. It's basically Jeff Johns throwing things at us extremely fast. And so Barry Allen goes to take off and he initially looks at his hand for his ring, which houses his uniform and he doesn't see it. And in the process, trips on the stairs and falls down. And when he does, he comes face to face with his mother, Nora Allen. Now, this is basically Barry Allen's life going into a tailspin because his mother's alive here. He doesn't know how she's alive, but he knows that she's alive. At the same time, he was also supposed to uh, take her out to dinner for her birthday. And so this isn't as if, you know, she's suddenly been brought back to life. She's been here all along. And so we as the reader are basically playing catch up here. We're trying to wrap our minds around how something like this could have happened. And so as Barry and his mother begin conversing with one another, uh, what we also hear Barry doing is, is trying to gain his bearings with his mom, asking about the Justice League, asking who Superman is, asking who Batman is. She doesn't know who the Justice League are and she's never heard of Superman. Uh, she doesn't believe him when he says that he's the Flash, but she has heard of Batman. Now, this is when we switch to Gotham City and this is when I want to start kind of breaking away from the main Flashpoint story for a second and I want to start getting into the story of what happened to Bruce Wayne. So, following Batman here, uh, he's chasing a villain, you know, to the, you know, on, on some kind of a bridge and asking where the Joker's at. Now, something I also want you to take note of is how ruthless Batman is here right now. Uh, we expect, you know, Batman to basically interrogate people. We expect Batman to, to not really torture them, but to certainly make them feel as though they're in fear for their life if they do not give him the information that he needs. His fear is really his greatest asset. But as this character goes tumbling down and actually seems to fall to her death, she's rescued by Cyborg. Now, Cyborg brings her back and uh, basically keeps her alive, but he also begins to ask questions of, uh, of Batman, you know, what it is that Batman's doing, why he's so cruel now, why it is that he's so much darker. But there's also a little bit of, uh, of recognition that this is simply just Batman's way, that Batman allows people to die, that Batman himself actually kills people. But something else is that he also chases villains to the same alley every single time he pursues them. And this is something I'd like you to take note of, because what we do is we switch into the actual story of whatever happened to Bruce Wayne. Switching back to Barry Allen and talking with his mother, because of the fact that things are so radically different here, one of the first things he wants to do is basically get with Iris West, the woman that he is, that's that's part and parcel to his life. The one person who's really more significant than anybody else. And the idea here is that maybe Iris knows what's going on. Maybe Iris has an understanding of how everything's changed. But as soon as he gets to her place of work, as soon as he gets to the Central City Citizen, to her news organization, he finds out that she's actually in a relationship with somebody else, that she's not with him. And so again, this is just another example of how everything's kind of gone cattywampus. Everything's gone haywalls. But we also learn that while Nora Allen is standing outside waiting on Barry, someone says, how nice to meet you alive and well, Mrs. Allen. Now, the indication here is that this is Eobard Thawne, simply by the draw, by the, the art that we're given here, but we're not told for sure. And before, you know, Nora Allen can investigate any further, Barry Allen returns and simply asks to use her car. And so from here, we switch back to Batman with Cyborg. And Batman is basically greeted by all these different, these different superheroes, the most prominent superheroes as they exist at the time. Uh, of course, Citizen Cold, but more notably than this is the fact that we meet Shazam or what seems to be Shazam. Now, this is not Shazam as we know him, which is to say Billy Batson. Instead, these are basically the Shazam kids. This is an instance whereby it's Shazam composed of a multitude of kids, but instead of him being Shazam, being Captain Marvel, he's called Captain Thunder. And what happens is that these kids all shout Shazam at the same time and they become a singular being. More so than that, we're also told that Wonder Woman and Aquaman are at war with one another. Now, again, this is not information that's readily given to us. We're basically kind of being thrown all this information really, really fast by Jeff Johns, and he's kind of giving us teasers. He's kind of giving us, you know, a preview of things to come. And this is one of the reasons why Jeff Johns is such a good writer, because he doesn't just throw all the origins and all the basis behind everything at you at one time. He basically wets your palate. He gives you a reason to keep wanting to come back. And so because of the fact that Barry Allen is aware of, uh, you know, that, or I guess he's told that Batman does exist in his own, you know, in, in his past, as far as he remembers, Batman operates out of Wayne Manor. And so he travels to Gotham City. He travels to Wayne Manor. He calls out for Alfred. Alfred's nowhere to be seen or found. He goes through, descends down into the Batcave. And instead of finding these huge supercomputers and, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment, instead, he finds a couple of wooden desks. He finds an office chair, some kind of graph and a picture hanging on a wall. And that's it. You know, of course, there's a gun there, but there's 
nothing there. There's this Bruce Wayne as we know him does not seem to exist. And so he's met with the arrival of Batman and Batman immediately begins interrogating Barry Allen, but Barry Allen keeps calling him out by the name Bruce Wayne. And the person responds by saying that this isn't that he's not Bruce Wayne, that he watched Bruce Wayne die. And it's revealed to us that Batman is actually Thomas Wayne. And so what we do here is we switch over to the story to officially whatever happened to Bruce Wayne, instead of kind of teasing you guys with it, because I know you guys are probably wanting to know by now, we switch over to the story where we basically learn why it is that Thomas Wayne is Batman. This particular explanation is given to us in a story, Batman Night of Vengeance. And this is what DC did when they launched Flashpoint. Because it was its own cohesive universe, they gave us a series of three issue tie-ins, three issue story arcs. It covered a lot of different things. Abin Sur, Hal Jordan, uh, it covered uh, Citizen Cold. It covered a lot of the characters that we've come to see as either important characters, villain or otherwise, in the role or in the life of Barry Allen, as well as more notable heroes, you know, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, and, and so on and so forth. And what we learn is that because Thomas Wayne seems to have survived his son's death, he's grown very bitter. But more so than that, he has basically turned, you know, Wayne Enterprises into a giant amalgamation of casinos, so to speak. Basically, it's it's not Wayne Enterprises as we know it with technology and different things like that. It's just a whole bunch of casinos. And so because of this, business is a little strange here, but at the same time, he's proven himself to be wildly ruthless, but also home to some rather seedy individuals. The Penguin basically makes his way in, uh, in Wayne Casino. Jim Gordon, of course, functions in a lot of the same capacity, but the main, the main focus here, the main story here, uh, really seems to be Joker. Emphasis is consistently put on Joker. Now, this particular story was written by Brian Azzarello. It was not written by Jeff Johns, but Azzarello does a really good job of giving us a reason to wonder who the Joker is, because the Joker is constantly being referenced over and over and over again. And so what we do is we learn from Jim Gordon that there have apparently been some children who have been kidnapped by the Joker, and Batman's idea is to find out where they are and, of course, to save their lives. And as he goes through during his investigations, he runs into Killer Croc. Now, this again is a huge difference between some of what we've seen in the traditional DC comics and what we see in Flashpoint. Because Flashpoint is designed to be much darker than the traditional run of DC comics, we're shown an instance whereby Killer Croc is cannibalizing people. And this is always something that we knew. And there have been a few times where this is something that DC sort of, you know, given credence to, but we've never actually seen an instance, at least that I'm aware of, where he has people hanging around and body parts missing because he's been eating them. And so the result is that as he and Thomas Wayne start to get into a fight with one another, Thomas Wayne does not hold anything back because he's so cruel, because he's so ruthless, he actually kills Killer Croc. He simply smashes him in the head with a machete and that's the end of him. And so what we do is we also get a little bit of explanation here. We get a little bit of backstory here in the sense that while we are usually aware of the idea that, you know, Thomas Wayne died in the traditional DC universe during the shootout with Joe Chill or during the robbery with Joe Chill, instead it was, you know, it was, it was Bruce Wayne who was killed by accident. Now, this is basically fleshed out over the course of this particular three issue story arc. It's kind of given to us in sections, but the final scene of this first issue, you know, of, of Batman uh, Night of Vengeance gives us the Joker, and it shows that the Joker, of course, is holding these particular people hostage, but the Joker looks markedly different. The Joker has long hair, the Joker's a little slender than we would normally expect to see him, and so we end up picking back up again with Batman's continued search of these missing children. Now, something else here is that Selina Kyle is not Catwoman. Selina Kyle is not, you know, uh, a cat burglar as we come to know her. Instead, she's a quadriplegic. She is stuck in a wheelchair and completely has, is totally unable to use the ability to walk. Uh, this is a marked difference. You know, it's it's not the most significant aspect of the story, but it's designed by Brian Azzarello to show us how much things have changed, how drastically different things are. And so what ends up happening is we pick up with the Joker as the Joker is basically taunting these children. And the Joker seems to have an extreme, I wouldn't say uh, obsession, I would say so much as a, as, as an extreme issue, you know, with children, you know, the idea that the value of children should not be something that exists because in the end, it'll drive you absolutely insane. This is basically kind of Brian Azzarello throwing hints at us, you know, on what it is that happened with the Joker, what it is that made the Joker who they were. In addition to this, we also learn that Selena Kyle is basically operating as Oracle. Now, and this is also a huge difference here because normally Oracle is Barbara Gordon and instead it's Selena Kyle. Now, 
going through this, it may have been that I've missed something up to this point, but no explanation seems to have been given on what happened to Barbara Gordon. But I would surmise that she probably died at some point along the line, or she simply just never became Batgirl. But again, this may just be that I've missed something. Uh, it may be that I've, I've, I missed something obvious. Uh, if I did, you know, feel free to post that down below. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys will. But in the end, uh, because of the fact that Oracle serves a very, per a very similar purpose to how she does in the DC universe, the traditional DC universe, she's a broker of information. She is the back end of the technological side of the Batman, you know, the Batman mythos. She gives, you know, I guess in this instance, Thomas Wayne and Jim Gordon the information they need in order to, uh, in order to succeed in their campaigns. And so we learn that, uh, at least from Oracle, where it is that Joker is holding these children hostage. Now, when Jim Gordon makes his way into the room, initially all he sees is the Joker standing there with her guns over top of this particular child. And when Jim Gordon breaks in and shoots, he actually ends up shooting the little girl, the girl that had been kidnapped. And so this again shows us how sadistic and how dark this version of the Joker is. But more so than that, uh, while, while this entire situation is being overheard, one, Jim Gordon is killed. He's stabbed, or I guess has his throat slit by the Joker. But two, you know, Thomas Wayne is overhearing everything that's going on. He's also being sent a broadcast by the Joker, which is, seems to be in the form of a video or at the very least in the form of a picture. It shows Jim Gordon being killed. But more so than that, because of what everything that's going on, Thomas Wayne reveals to us that the Joker is actually Martha Wayne. It's the mother of Bruce Wayne. And so what issue number three does is it basically gives us the events that have unfolded in the life of Thomas and Martha Wayne after the death of Bruce Wayne. And what we learn is that when Batman arrives, you know, when Thomas Wayne arrives, uh, he basically, you know, this, this girl being dead, uh, he does what he can to, you know, console the boy. He does what he can to try to keep this girl alive, even though she's pretty much gone. But the backstory that's given to us is that because Bruce Wayne had died, Martha did not initially crack. She showed early signs, you know, of sort of losing her sanity, but it wasn't an immediate thing. Instead, it was a slow progression in the sense that Thomas basically kept telling her, you know, you've got to try to get past this. We all have to try to get past this. We all have to work on this as best we can. And what he says is the one thing he misses more than anything else, aside from Bruce Wayne, is Martha smiling. But she doesn't really seem to be snapping out of this psychotic break. She doesn't really seem to be getting past this, you know, this insanity, you know, that, that she's experiencing. And so what we're told is that Thomas Wayne uses his resources, uses his money to find the location of Joe Chill by going through some less than savory, you know, sources. And in the end, once he locates Joe Chill, uh, he basically beats him to death with his bare hands. And so the result is that when he comes back, when he comes home to his wife, Martha, he tells her that Joe Chill's dead, that he's killed Joe Chill. But when Martha turns around, she's given herself a Glasgow smile, the traditional Joker smile where he has his, uh, has his cheeks cut. And she says that, that she's finally happy now that she's finally smiling. And so this was basically the psychotic break. You know, of course, uh, Thomas Wayne had her committed to an insane asylum, and this was her downward spiral to officially becoming the Joker. Now, while this backstory was given to us, as you guys probably noticed, we were also seeing Martha fighting her husband in real time, in, in the current moment, you know, and again, he tries to convince her, he tries to get her to come back. Now, this is the big difference here, because in, in the normal DC continuity, by the time the conflict comes around, assuming that, you know, we, we sort of uh, skip past the origin story of the Joker, or the perceived origin story, with the killing joke and we pick up with, you know, uh, Batman's normal encounters with the Joker, by that point in time, he was long gone. Any semblance or any chance of returning to normalcy was out the window. You know, the Joker was who he was and he was going to be the Joker for the rest of his life. Uh, with Martha Wayne, it's not that way. It seems as though her current role as the Joker is not that far removed from when she was simply just Martha trying to deal with the death of her son. And this is apparent in the fact that Thomas Wayne tries to talk her back to normal. He tries to bring her back to normal. Uh, she's initially resistant, but what he says is, and this is actually kind of of skipping forward a little bit in the sense of the main Flashpoint story. After conversing with Barry Allen, Thomas Wayne is basically told by Barry everything Barry remembers from his own life, that Bruce Wayne was the one who lived, Thomas Wayne was the one who died along with Martha, and that Bruce Wayne became Batman fighting crime in Gotham City. And this is what Thomas says, that, you know, of course, assuming that Barry Allen is to be believed, that Thomas Wayne has the ability to go back and to make things right. He, he basically gives Martha the way the situation should have played out. He says that it should have been, you know, both Martha 
Martha and Thomas that died and Bruce Wayne that lived. And it seemed as though he was connecting with her for a moment. It seemed as though he was, you know, she was starting to understand that she was starting to return. But in the end, her insanity kicks back in again and she basically runs off. And in the situation when Thomas Wayne is chasing her, she ultimately falls down a hole, which ironically enough uh, is actually the hole that uh, Bruce Wayne seems to discover in order for him to become Batman. You know, she falls down the hole and she basically dies. She she falls to her death. And that's the end of Martha Wayne as the Joker. But but this is basically the story of how Thomas Wayne became Batman. So if you guys enjoyed this, uh, you know, drop a like, <laughs> hit the sub button, become part of the Rob Corps, and leave a comment. Uh, let me know what you guys think about this particular story, whatever happened to Bruce Wayne. Um, let me know what you guys' thoughts are, you know, because in truth, assuming that there's interest in this, you know, assuming that there's, there's some measure of popularity, I wouldn't mind going through and kind of covering the Flashpoint universe, how characters changed, what happened with different people, so on and so forth. So picking up with uh, Flashpoint Part 2, we initially start with Slade Wilson with Deathstroke. Now, this is a very interesting set of circumstances because we would expect to see Deathstroke assassinating people or something along those lines, but instead, Deathstroke's actually a pirate. Now, to be honest here, I really like what Jeff Johns did with Deathstroke. I really like the idea of Deathstroke being a pirate. Somehow it just fits. I mean, not necessarily because Deathstroke is, is cold-hearted, but because in a lot of ways, Deathstroke is just a loner, but he's also kind of a guy you don't mess with. And you could easily see him, you know, being a modern day pirate, which again, I think works perfectly. But what we also know is that because they're pirates, they're basically just searching the world over for salvage. They're just looking for, uh, they're, they're just trying to live, essentially. They're just taking it day by day. And what they're doing is they're using the powers of a character named Sonar. Now, Sonar is, is actually interesting. And this is why I think Jeff Johns did a great job with Flashpoint, because Sonar was a, a minor villain at best. You know, he was largely a Green Lantern villain, and he had the ability to manipulate sound. But instead of him being a guy that just kind of lays waste to things and fighting alongside, or maybe even being a hero, instead, he's just being used as an object here. He's basically serving as a way for Slade Wilson to scan underwater and see if there's anything worth getting. Now, this is effectively torture for Sonar, just because of the fact that in order for him to use his powers effectively or to be forced to use his powers effectively, he's being electrocuted by another character named Electric Eel. And so again, this is just showing us how ruthless and how harsh life is in this Flashpoint society and that individuals' characters are just kind of being torn to pieces and just being forced to live miserable lives. But during their uh, during their scouting mission, they come across uh, another ship and when they see its flag, they realize it belongs to a character named Warlord. The problem here is that the ship and everybody on it has been absolutely massacred. And this is, this is shown to us by the fact that Europe seems to have been entirely flooded. Now, this is why we have, you know, Slade Wilson running around as a pirate, but we also learn that his ship has been set upon by Aquaman. Now, this is where things get a little crazy here. This is where things get a little weird. Initially, we were just kind of left to our own devices to figure things out, but with Aquaman being so ruthless, we actually switched back to Gotham City with Barry Allen and Thomas Wayne. Now, again, for those of you guys who were just getting caught up, for those of you guys who saw the last video, this part of the video or this part of our discussion takes place uh, prior to the adventure between, you know, the main Flashpoint story in the last video and our segment on what happened to Bruce Wayne. And so this kind of fills in the gaps for those of you guys who are waiting for this bit of information to come around. Uh, because Barry Allen realizes that this is Thomas Wayne, he kind of he's kind of shocked here. Uh, Thomas Wayne again doesn't know who Barry Allen is. From his perspective, this is just a random guy who showed up, who discovered his location in the Batcave, and he doesn't know what his intentions are. But Barry is actually able to talk sense into Thomas Wayne, even if Thomas is only a little bit skeptical here. But what also happens is Barry's mind is kind of being fractured in the sense that his memories of the way things used to be and his memories of the way things are now are starting to converge in the sense that he's losing his former self. What we're told is that at some point along the line, Wonder Woman and Aquaman had basically engaged in war with one another. That Wonder Woman had led a blitzkrieg in tearing London to pieces and that uh, Aquaman had flooded the entirety of Europe. Now, there is a tie-in that explains what happened here. There is an explanation on what it is that took place. It kind of provides the backstory here, which again, you know, I'm all for going over if you guys are interested or if you guys just kind of want to stick with the main story for what it is, it's, it's fine by me. But because of the fact that Barry is starting to experience you know, this emergence of memories, what Jeff Johns has basically done here is he's given us a time frame. He's basically said that if things don't go back to normal after a certain amount of time, Barry Allen will lose everything that makes him who he is, and he'll basically be stuck in this timeline, remembering how things are as opposed to the way things should be. And so during this bit of recall, so to speak, his ring falls out, falls out of his pocket. Now, again, this is what Barry Allen houses his uniform in, you know, whenever it is he's on the run, whenever he's on the move, he always has his ring there so he can pop it out for easy access, do whatever it is he needs to do. And 
and then go back to being his normal self. And this is when he tells Thomas Wayne, he says that he has the ring whenever he needs to be a superhero and he'll prove to Thomas Wayne that he's the Flash, even if he doesn't have his powers, he'll prove to Thomas Wayne who he is by virtue of showing him his Flash costume. But when he uses the ring and when he brings his costume out, it's actually the costume of Reverse Flash, Eobard Thawn. And Barry Allen immediately comes to the belief, comes to the conclusion that Eobard Thawn has somehow screwed with time. Now, this is interesting here because as far as we know, Eobard Thawn was trapped in the Speed Force, you know, during the end of Flash Rebirth. We don't, we don't have any reason to believe that Eobard Thawn is involved here, but because of the fact that the Speed Force is outside of space and time, a person who's there could access any point in time. This is compounded by the fact that Eobard Thawn has the ability to manipulate time, which is why he was able to go back through and screw up the life of Barry Allen, leading him to become the Flash in the first place, all of which of course was covered in my last video. In the end, Barry Allen basically makes the case that this is all Eobard Thawne's doing, that Eobard Thawne had somehow gone into the past and changed things. And because things have been changed, Barry Allen basically sees himself as the one person that could make things the way that they're supposed to be. Now, of course, he gives Thomas Wayne a bit of his backstory. He gives Thomas Wayne an explanation that Eobard Thawne, who lived in the 25th century, became obsessed with Barry Allen, traveled into the past, realized that he was going to be a bad guy, which broke his sanity, and then went further into the past and began engineering the circumstances of Barry Allen's life that led him to becoming the Flash, including switching chemicals around so that when Barry Allen was struck by lightning, he would become the Flash, uh, killing Barry Allen's mother, Nora Allen, uh, forcing Barry Allen's family to move. All the things that led up to that particular moment uh, were all done by Eobard Thawne. And so Barry Allen makes the case that in order for things to go back to normal, in order for Bruce Wayne to live and Thomas Wayne to die, that, that Thomas basically has to help Barry Allen get his speed back. He has to help him become the Flash again. And so what we do is we switch over to London, which has now been christened as, as New Themyscira under the control of Wonder Woman. And we see a soldier who we don't initially know who he is going through and trying to keep himself alive against the forces of the Amazons, trying to trying to keep from dying, to be quite frank. But in the middle of this conflict, he's initially he's eventually captured and taken prisoner by Wonder Woman, who uses her lasso of truth. Now, again, the lasso of truth basically forces those who use the lasso or who were ensnared in the lasso to tell the truth. And it does have its weaknesses, which we can get into at a later date once we get closer to the Wonder Woman movie. But the lasso of truth is used on this soldier who reveals himself to be Steve Trevor. Now, again, this is just Jeff John showing us another instance of how things have changed because Steve Trevor was basically Wonder Woman's liaison to the world of humans when she first arrived. But more so than that, he was her first major love interest among normal society. And so to see them as bitter enemies is a huge difference. It tells us that most likely Wonder Woman never left Amazon or never left the Mascara in the first place. Even if she did, things didn't turn out quite the same way. Now, we're not told if Steve Trevor played a role in that, but I would surmise that because Steve Trevor was Wonder Woman's way of segueing in a normal society, because he showed her so many different things, because he showed her how to conduct herself as a normal person, he was basically able to make her uh, human, you know, to, to take her away from this uh, this life that she had previously led and allowed her to become a stronger character because now she was able to balance her life in Themyscira as well as her life as a regular superhero, which eventually in the New 52 gave way to a romance with Superman himself. But what we also learn is that Steve Trevor is here for the purpose of rescuing Lois Lane. Now, the reason for this is that Lois Lane is one of the greatest journalists in the world at the moment, and she had basically gone undercover into London to gather as much information as possible for Cyborg who's working on behalf of the U.S. government in order to allow him to organize an attack and to basically subvert the forces of Wonder Woman. Now, something that you may have noticed here and something you may be scratching your head about is if Lois Lane is in London and she is in danger, why hasn't Superman rescued her yet? And we will actually get to that later on in this story. But instead, we switch back to Gotham City. And this is basically kind of like a Jimmy rigged experiment. What's happening here is uh, Barry Allen and Thomas Wayne have rigged a... Uh, really an, an execution, you know, an, an electrocution chair uh, in order to put Barry Allen in the situation where he'll be doused in the same chemicals that he was when he first got his powers. And then he'll be struck by lightning during a rainstorm and he'll become the Flash again. At least that's their hope. The problem with this is that when this happens, when this lightning strike takes place and when Barry Allen is hit by lightning, he doesn't become the Flash. Instead, he's just covered in scars. He is absolutely fried. And so it seems as though there's no way for Barry Allen to become the Flash again. At least that's the information that's given to us at the conclusion of this second issue by Jeff Johns. But with that being said, if you guys are enjoying this so far, uh, drop a like, hit the sub button, become part of the Rob Corps, and leave a comment. I gotta tell you guys, Flashpoint's one of the best stories that I've read in a long time because for me, you know, as a comic book fan, there's nothing I love more than seeing alternate realities where things just go really bad. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I don't mean to sound cynical. I don't mean to make it sound like I'm a terrible person, but I think we all like that. I think we all like to see what happens when superheroes go bad or when the world just descends into chaos. We love dystopian stuff. If you guys love dystopian stuff, like post a comment. Tell me, tell me why it is that you love Flashpoint so much. Is it because it's just a different take on characters or is it because things are just really, really bad? <laughs> <laughs> because that's my reason. I just love seeing things really, really bad. So as we get into Flashpoint Part 3, what we do here is we backtrack for a second and we're going to cover the story of Wonder Woman and the Furies. Now, this particular story gives us the events, or at least one part of the events, that led up to the conflict between uh, Wonder Woman and Aquaman. But more so than that, it tells us why Europe is in such disarray. Now, Dan Abnett was the one that gave us the story and he actually did it in a really, really good way. He did a, a really awesome job with helping us come to grips with everything that's happened so far. What we're told is that with Arthur Curry at a young age, instead of falling in love with Mira and marrying her as his queen, instead he had met Wonder Woman. Now, the two of them had simply just met each other by virtue of their own adventure and their own uh, celebration. And, and in, in truth, this is basically Dad Abnett telling us that Arthur Curry is the stand-in for Steve Trevor. Instead of T uh, Steve Trevor being the first man that Wonder Woman meets and eventually falls in love with, instead uh, she ends up falling in love with Arthur Arthur Curry. Now, they're both attacked by a sea monster, or at least she's attacked by a sea monster, and Arthur Curry comes to her rescue. But because of the fact that she is uh, a character that, you know, is strong in her own right with regards to being on New Themyscira, and because the Atlanteans don't usually deal with surface dwellers, in a lot of ways, their love was kind of forbidden. It was a very Romeo and Juliet sort of situation in the sense that instead of it being their parents who were against the, uh, the union between Wonder Woman and Aquaman, instead, it was actually a couple people. It was Artemis on the, uh, from from New Themyscira, and it was Aquaman's brother Orm who were against this. Now, in terms of why they were against this and why they instigated this war in the first place, this will be covered as we get further into Flashpoint, simply because I don't want to give certain things away. But the fact remains that uh, both Artemis and Orm had instigated what appeared to be an assassination on Wonder Woman at the hands of an Atlantean. And so a spear was thrown, and Queen Hippolyta had basically seen the spear coming at her daughter and dived in the way. The result was that she had died, and in return, turn, Wonder Woman believed that it was an Atlantean. Now, this is later on uh, revealed to actually be Artemis herself who had thrown the spear, and Aqualad had stepped in. I guess, you know, the sidekick, you know, Garth, the sidekick of Aquaman, had discovered what was going on, but in the confrontation, uh, he was effectively killed, you know, when he was thrown off a balcony. And so, with the body of, of Garth showing up here, when the, when, because Artemis had not been found, in the end, it was believed by the Amazons that the Atlanteans were engaging in war. They were attempting to use this union between Arthur Curry and Wonder Woman as a means to subvert the Mascara and take it over in its entirety. And so the result is that the uh, the Atlanteans are kicked off the island and the Amazons begin the process of going through the traditional three-day ritual uh, to mourn the loss of their queen. Now, this puts both Aquaman and Wonder Woman in a tough situation because in truth, they are king and queen first and their hero second. And what I mean by that is throughout their entire history, really more so with Aquaman than with Wonder Woman, uh, Aquaman has always been in a situation where if it came down to the fact that Atlantis was being attacked and the Justice League was being attacked at the same time, he would choose Atlantis over Justice League almost every single time just because he's a king first and he's a hero second. With Wonder Woman, it was never really the same way traditionally. She would always stand up for Themyscira, but she always recognized that her role was more significant to the world than it was to her people. And so she was always in a tough situation because she routinely had to choose between her own people and, you know, the, I guess, the Earth as a whole, as humanity, and the relationships that she had forged alongside the other members of the Justice League. In Flashpoint, it's not that way. Because of the fact that she is now the Queen, uh, because of the fact that the perception is the Atlanteans are trying to wage war and trying to take over Themyscira, her loyalty is entirely to her people, especially considered the fact that the Justice League does not exist here. And so because of this, during this morning phase, she's constantly getting, you know, receiving words of poison from Artemis. At the same time, you know, Aquaman is constantly receiving words of poison from his brother Orm, and they're basically seeding conflict between the two of them. They're seeding war between the two of them. Now, again, they're not necessarily wanting to do this, and what ends up happening here is Aquaman actually travels to Themyscira for the purpose of trying to mend this rift between the two of them. It's really an olive branch trying to make the case that, yes, the death of Queen Hippolyta was very tragic, but it was not committed by Atlanteans. There's something else going on here, but because the Amazons are in uh, a state of grief, 
brief. Because virtually all of them, except for Artemis, are unaware of the fact that it was actually a ploy that was going on that is designed to be a ruse, Artemis basically uh, calls in an attack. She calls in a huge conflict between the Atlanteans and the Amazons, and the result is that again, in the eyes of Wonder Woman, the Atlanteans are engaging in yet another instance of treachery. And so because of the fact that the, the Atlanteans seem to be winning the war, because of the fact that Wonder Woman's not aware of uh, of Artemis sabotaging the Amazons themselves to make it look like the, uh, the Atlanteans are winning, in the end, Wonder Woman makes the case that they need to abandon, or at least she's kind of forced in a position to abandon Themyscira to blow up the island and take refuge elsewhere. And this is exactly what she does. She basically sets off the, or I guess releases, the restraints that are normally used in Themyscira and allows it to explode. Now, what I mean by this is for those of you guys who don't know, and at least it's really cool because it's given to us by Dan Abnett as he gives us this explanation, the Themyscira lives, it exists on a, uh, on a volcano and the Amazons harness the geothermal energy of this volcano in order to provide what they need for survival. The result is that restraints are needed in order to keep the volcano from going active and exploding. What Wonder Woman did is she removed these restraints. And so as the Atlanteans are fleeing for dear life, the uh, the island is exploding all around them. Now from here, Dan Abnett fast tracks a few things. He actually gives us information from the eyes of a reporter named Jack Ryder. And what he tells us is that after the, the destruction of the Mascara, its remaining citizens took off in fleets and they basically went to Europe. They went to, uh, to the United Kingdom, to England as refugees. They looked to England to house them, to give them a place to stay temporarily until they could reform the Mascara. The problem is that England said no. And so Wonder Woman decided to take it by force. She literally launched an invasion of England. She presented herself to Parliament and said, and basically justified her case saying that we are in need of a home. Your home is as good as any. It now belongs to us. And this basically gives us a darker side of Wonder Woman. But it also tells us, even if indirectly behind the scenes, that maybe everything that she's doing isn't things that she wants to do. She's doing them because she has loyalty to her people. Her goal is to make sure that Themyscira has a home. And if that home means taking the home of somebody else, then that's what she will do. As a result, she also began gathering some of the most powerful women in DC Comics around her, calling them the Furies. Now, this is basically Dan Abnett paying a little bit of tribute to the history of Wonder Woman, in the sense that the Furies are actually an organization or a group that exists under Darkseid and is composed of his most powerful women. They are forced to be reckoned with, and there was actually a story where Wonder Woman was inducted into the Furies against her will for a time. And so this is basically Dan Abnett saying that even if we're not going to see Darkseid, Side, even if we won't see his Furies, we will see some tribute to the concept of the Furies themselves. Now, while this is going on, you know, while this conflict is taking place, we pick back up with Aquaman. And again, he's being put in a hard in a hard spot here. He's being put in a situation where he's being asked to do things that he doesn't really want to do. The idea is that because of the fact that the Amazons have wiped out Themyscira, because they have engaged in war, because both Atlantis and Amazons are at war with one another, the idea is that the Atlanteans need to repay in kind. They need to do something to show the Amazons that they are not to be pushed around, that they cannot simply be walked over. And so the idea is to basically lay waste to Themyscira by destroying England. And so while Aquaman doesn't want to do this, he also asks the question where his wife Mira is located. And so what we do is we switch to the port of Dover in England, in New Themyscira. And what happens is Mira makes her presence known. Mira basically attacks the Amazons along with a host of Atlantean soldiers. Now, while the Atlantean soldiers are holding their own against the Amazons, Mira and Wonder Woman engage in a fight with one another. And when they do, the fight is actually pretty swift. There's really not much of a contest here. Wonder Woman comes out on top and she cuts off the head of Mira. And because of this, because Mira is now, you know, or at least because she was betrothed to uh, Aquaman, he takes this as the utmost threat. He takes this as something that cannot be called back. And so he effectively declares open war on the Amazons for the first time in the midst of this conflict and in doing so, orders the entire sinking of Europe at the hands of the Atlantean superweapons. Having said that, as we continue our discussion with the main Flashpoint story itself, we pick back up again with Thomas Wayne and Barry Allen. Now, I do apologize if I keep saying Bruce Wayne. Uh, incidentally, it's just I'm not used to saying Thomas Wayne Batman. <laughs> 
<laughs> it kind of throws me off kilter whenever I have to say that. I kind of have to pause and make sure that I didn't actually say Bruce Wayne. But if I happen to do that in the future of these videos, uh, don't hold it against me. It's just, it's something I'm not used to saying Thomas Wayne Batman. It's just kind of crazy to me. But that's one of the reasons why this story is so cool because it just gives us different depictions of characters that we've come to know and love. And so with uh, Barry Allen having been electrocuted due to the fact that he was trying to uh, get his powers back, the lightning storm simply just frying his body, uh, where Thomas Wayne takes him back to the Batcave, tries to nurse him back to health, in the end, Barry Allen wants to try again. Now, from the perspective of Thomas Wayne, this is absolutely crazy because in his mind, a, a guy just showed up on his doorstep, said he was the fastest man alive, got his powers that way because he was doused with chemicals and electrocuted, and when he tries to repeat the process, he just ends up getting fried again. But because of the fact that Barry Allen seems to have information on the way things are supposed to be, he can't help but believe Barry. He can't help but believe that if there's a single chance that Bruce Wayne lives instead of dies, that he has to help him here. Now, again, what Jeff Johns also does is he reminds us that things are beginning to fracture, that things are beginning to change, that because of the fact that this new reality is totally different in the sense that Abin Sur is the Green Lantern instead of Hal Jordan, which if you guys are interested, I can do the story of whatever happened to Hal Jordan. Uh, because of the fact that these memories are beginning to fragment, that Jeff Johns is reminding us they're on a timetable here, the time's running out, that they have to hurry up. And this is basically Barry Allen giving us this information, saying that time is running out, they have to do something. And so in order for, for Bruce Wayne to live, in order for things to be turned back to normal, you know, Thomas Wayne has to help Barry get his powers back. And so what they do is they go right back to the rooftop again, and they go through the process of dousing Barry in chemicals yet again. And when Barry is electrocuted, this time it works, and his powers of the Flash are restored to him. And so what happens is that while Barry is recovering, because of the fact that his powers of the Flash grant him enhanced healing in the sense that he can recover from, you know, flesh injuries much faster than a normal human can, we transition to New Themyscira in London, and we pick up with... Lois Lane. Now, this is actually really cool because this is basically Jeff Johns beginning the early stages of rolling, you know, Wildstorm characters, non-main DC characters over into DC, uh, DC's landscape. For those of you guys who don't know, um, DC Comics is only one facet of the that big side of the comic arm. We've got Wildstorm, you've got Vertigo, which is their adult-oriented imprint. You've got a lot of different, uh, different characters that hail from that side of the spectrum, you know, under the uh, larger umbrella of DC. And the purpose of the New 52 was to take those characters and roll them over into a single continuity. And this is exactly what Jeff Johns is doing. During this entire uh, situation where Lois Lane is trying to, you know, get back into contact with uh, Steve Trevor, even though she doesn't know at the moment that he's been taken prisoner by the Amazons, what she does is she comes face to face with the Resistance, who's led by Grifter. Now, Grifter is a Wildstorm character. We don't really need to go super in-depth into him. Again, I think what we've said so far about, you know, Wildstorm and so on is, is enough to suffice our explanation. But more so than that, what this tells us is that the citizens of England didn't just roll over. It wasn't as though, you know, the Wonder Woman showed up, invaded uh, London, and they just kind of gave up and walked away. Instead, there's small pockets of resistance. The problem here is they're effectively going up against forces who are wildly powerful. Wonder Woman having power equivalent to that of Superman. And the result is that they were laid waste to almost immediately. You know, England was conquered almost right off the bat. And so they do the best they can, but to be honest here, they're basically fighting a losing battle. And so what we do is we jump back to, uh, to Thomas Wayne, and he's looking, you know, at Barry Allen because of the fact that he has enhanced healing, because of the fact that uh, he's recovering from his injuries extremely fast. This gives credence to the argument he's been making that things are not the way they're supposed to be. And so what Barry Allen does is he uses his super speed. He grabs different chemicals and so on and so forth, and he makes a new Flash costume super fast, which isn't really supposed to be something significant here. It's just sort of Jeff Johns giving us that, you know, yes, things are getting back on track. Yes, the story is moving forward. Yes, we're going to start seeing things return to a state of normalcy sort of moment, kind of the, the tipping point, so to speak, of the story at this point where things are going to start transitioning uh, in favor of everyone. And so the one question Barry Allen has is where is Superman? Because Superman is the one character who could literally change the entire tide of battle. Superman can go toe to toe with Aquaman and Wonder Woman and defeat them both, as well as give humanity something to aspire to. And so his question is, if Superman's not here, then where is he? Did he simply just not arrive on the planet Earth? Does his rocket never show up here? And so both he and Thomas Wayne start going through old footage. And we actually get some really cool uh, explanation here on a couple things. One of the things that Jeff John shows us or tells us is that at some point in the past, Hal Jordan had piloted an experimental test plane. The reason why this matters is because that's how jo Hal Jordan became the Green Lantern originally. He was piloting a test plane. He was chosen by the ring of the dying Abin Sur, and he was inducted into the Green Lantern Corps. The rest is history. Uh, Jeff Johns doesn't really give us any more than this. Again, this is covered in a, uh, a tie-in, but what we're also
also told is that there, the rocket of Superman did crash land in Metropolis. And so again, Barry Allen tells Thomas Wayne that Superman is the most powerful person on the planet. And so if they can find Superman, assuming that he's here, if they can locate him and assuming he's not a bad guy, have him fight on their behalf, they can quite literally save the world. And so while Thomas Wayne says that he doesn't know where Superman is, he knows a person who does. And so we pick up with Barry Allen and Thomas Wayne meeting with Cyborg, who again is working on behalf of the US government and he has access to all their information. And so what he says is yes, he will help them find Superman, but only under the condition that they fight alongside him in trying to take back the world. And so what they do is they transition to New Metropolis. And when they get there, they basically travel to a military base underground. And this military base has been in existence since Superman first arrived on Earth. Once they get there and they open up this giant room, they find Superman, but he's nothing like the one that we know. Instead, he's emaciated. He's very thin and he seems like a normal human being. Now, the reason why this happened, and we can actually kind of skip over the tie-in a little bit here. The reason why this happened was because when Superman first arrived, instead of being discovered by the Kents and instead of being adopted and taken under their wing where he would eventually become, uh, you know, Clark Kent and eventually become Superman, instead, he was immediately taken by the federal government. And when he was, he was held in stasis with red light, which kept his powers from emerging because he never experienced the yellow sun. He's lived his entire life underground inside this bunker, being held as a prisoner and being used for experimentation. And so once they break in, once they free Superman, this is strange to him because he's never seen people like this before. He's never seen people like him. But more so than that, or Barry Allen, this is wild because he's never seen a Superman that looks like this before. He's always seen a huge, confident, wildly powerful Superman. And so while they're trying, while, while both, you know, Superman and Barry Allen and the heroes are trying to come to grips with the situation, the soldiers break in and they basically begin the process of running them off. And so while they escape, while they are able to get out, the Superman comes in the contact with the yellow sun for the very first time. And he, of course, begins to fly. He starts showing his display of powers, but he's not in control here. He's not, he doesn't have total control over his heat vision. He doesn't have control over his flight. He's learning these things for the very first time. Now he masters them pretty fast, at least in terms of his ability to fly. But he basically, when he's asked by, you know, by Thomas Wayne, when he's asked, you know, to basically save them, to get them out of there, he takes off and he immediately heads out for the sun. And so as this issue comes to an end, we're basically left with Cyborg, Thomas Wayne and Barry Allen at the at the wrong end of guns from US soldiers, and it seems as though they're about to be taken prisoner. So as we continue our discussion on the Flashpoint storyline from DC Comics, what we do now is we pick up with the story of whatever happened to Hal Jordan. Now, this is actually, uh, in my mind, one of the best stories, or one of the best, you know, tie-ins to come out of the Flashpoint event. What we do is, is we're kind of fast-tracked, you know, on this, uh, this history of Hal Jordan. Something that kind of amazing about this is that this was actually written by Adam Schlagman. This was not written by Jeff Johns. And the reason why it kind of amazed me is because, you know, Jeff Johns is the Hal Jordan guy. He's the Green Lantern guy. Whether or not he wants that to be his legacy, the fact remains that he did such a good job on the Green Lantern that those who are familiar with Hal Jordan's mythology uh, really look at Jeff Johns as someone who's synonymous with the Green Lantern mythos. But what Adam Schlagman does is he sort of fast tracks a lot of the things that go on. And he basically sort of shows us the, the history of Hal Jordan in the sense that his his father was a pilot, um, that he wanted to be a pilot because he looked up to his father. He met uh, Carol at such a young, at such a young age, um, you know, that, that in the end, when his father died, it sort of shattered his life. And he ended up going to work, you know, for Ferris Air Force Base under Carol Ferris. And he proved himself to be a very prodigious pilot. This is very much um, indicative of what we would expect to see with his character. Uh, the issue here is that once everything started to change, and once we ended up in a scenario where the Atlanteans and the Amazons started waging war against one another, then it stopped being an instance where, you know, Hal Jordan was an experimental test pilot and instead started being an instance where he was basically training for military action. Now, he was not really part of ongoing military action per se, so much as it was always a background. It was always a backdrop. It was always at some point in time, he will get caught up in the conflict uh, in some form or fashion. Now, one of the things that Adam Schlagman does here is he throws a lot of the, uh, the mythos of Jeff John's Green Lantern run in passing, even if it's not necessarily 
necessarily overt. For example, because both Carol and himself are fighter pilots, you know, they are effectively partners. And she, I guess her, her cover name or her code name is Sapphire, which of course is a homage to Jeff John's reformation of Carol Ferris as becoming one of the star Sapphires in, uh, in the Green Lantern reboot. And so what ends up happening here is in the midst of this entire conflict, of course, he's attacked by, uh, by Shark Man and Shark Man is defeated, you know, using, uh, using the, the tactics of both, uh, Hal Jordan and himself, Carol. But even then it comes under scrutiny just because of the fact that they were, uh, they were using tactics that weren't necessarily approved <laughs> by their superiors. But the fact remains here that in the midst of this conflict, once it's over, uh, Hal Jordan is set upon by the arrival of Abin Sur. Now this is where things change wildly because in the, in the regular DC mythos, Abin Sur had arrived on earth and he was basically dying. And the result was that with his dying breath, he sent his ring forward to find a replacement and flashpoint that does not happen. Instead, Hal Jordan actually saves the life of Abin Sur. And so the indication here is that Hal Jordan does not become a green lantern. Instead, Abin Sur, and this is actually covered in a tie-in, was sent here to the planet earth for the purpose of finding the white lantern, uh, ring of life, basically finding the, the white lantern entity. And the idea was that Abin Sur was only going to be here temporarily. Instead, Abin Sur actually stayed here and became one of the heroes that fought alongside Cyborg to basically try to return things to a state of normalcy under the direction of the US government. And so while this happened, while Abin Sur went along and did his own thing as the Green Lantern on Earth, Hal Jordan uh, ended up taking an indirect approach. And what I mean here is that while he was fighting or at least observing alongside the US military, he was set upon by several uh, Amazon forces. And because of this, because the situation seemed to be growing out of the control of the governments of the world, Hal Jordan was tasked with dropping the Green Arrow nuclear bomb on England, basically in an attempt to wipe out the Amazons, or at the very least to subvert their ability to continue a forward campaign. The problem with this is that Carol Ferris does not like this idea. Now, one thing I want you guys to also take note of here is that the two are very much in love with one another, but Hal Jordan hasn't quite popped the question. He hasn't, hasn't quite brought himself to do that yet. And so against the wishes of Carol Ferris and under the direction of President Barack Obama in this story, uh, he has assigned the task of dropping the snook. Now he tries to talk to Carol one last time. He tries to communicate with her one last time, or at least to give her, you know, his side of the opinion. But in the end, it results in a fight between the two of them. And so while they are able to reconcile to a degree, it's not to the point where they make amends. It's not to the point where they are able to, to basically apologize appropriately. Now, this is a very big deal for Carol Ferris. And the reason why is that once they set their attack upon the Amazons and the forces are laid waste to uh, in swift order, Hal Jordan drops the nuclear bomb. And when he does, he actually dies in the explosion. He dies in the process. And so while Carol is able to make it back, while Hal Jordan does give her, her le his last goodbyes before he officially perishes, in her aftermath, in her grieving, uh, she's met with a package that was, that had belongings, uh, you know, for Hal Jordan. And as she goes through him, she finds a letter that he had written to her, which is actually something Adam had been covering over the course of the story. If you've been, you know, following along with the various panels that we've seen. And the idea was basically Hal Jordan writing her a love letter, you know, telling her that he loved her. He could just never really bring himself to say that he loved her and could never bring himself to give her an engagement ring. And so she's kind of left dealing with this grief as best she can. And this is why Hal Jordan never became the Green Lantern because he died bravely in a nuclear explosion in an attempt to wipe out the Amazons. Now, something I want to point out here, and this is one of the reasons why I was a little hesitant about doing the, uh, the Hal Jordan story is because it really coincides with this next part of the story that we're going to talk about. But it's also one of the reasons why I chose to do it now, uh, simply because of the fact that with the Flashpoint story, the tie-ins, uh, the, each of the three part tie-ins sort of followed along with the main event itself. And the third story usually told what was happening in issues four and five of the Flashpoint event leading up to this great big, huge final battle that was going on. And so what we do here is we pick up with, uh, uh, with Shazam. We pick up in Fawcett City. Now again, Shazam, or uh, at least I call him Shazam, is actually Captain Thunder in Flashpoint. Shazam is not just Billy Batson. Shazam is a culmination of kids, all of whom share some aspect of the Shazam power. And when they all say Shazam at the same time, they merge into a singular being. And the idea here is th they're kind of unsure whether or not they should fight against Wonder Woman. And the president is on the camp or on, a, on TV right now telling them that those individuals who are able to fight should fight, that the only way to 
to hold off the Amazons and the Atlanteans, it's for what's left of humanity to rise up and fight as a singular group and take on these two forces and rid the world of them because at this point in time, reason and logic doesn't stand a chance against them. There's really nothing they can do to go against the forces of both Wonder Woman and, uh, and Aquaman. The only way to basically save the world is to get rid of both of their regimes in their entirety. And so what we do is again, we switch over to Hal Jordan. And this again is of course, you know, just the segment where it's showing us that Hal Jordan is gearing up to drop the nuclear bomb. Uh, again, you know, of course we covered this uh, a little bit earlier, but more so than that, we switch back to Metropolis. Now, this of course comes as fallout from Barry Allen and uh, Thomas Wayne and Cyborg attempting to rescue Superman. But because Superman had basically taken off into the sun after seeing the sun for the very first time, they're really sort of left to their own devices. Now, they're not entirely powerless. Of course, Barry Allen has super speed. Uh, Cyborg has his different gadgets and, uh, and Thomas Wayne is very adept in terms of his ability to fight against them. Uh, the help here that they don't expect comes in the form of a girl named Emily Soon, but she's referred to as Element Woman. Now, this is interesting because Element Girl is uh, more or less the same kind of character as Metamorpho. Now, Metamorpho is a long running character in DC Comics. He's been around for quite some time and he gained his, you know, powers through mystical artifacts and so on and so forth. But the fact remains that he's able to change the shape, the, the structure of his body to more or less manipulate his body for a, mer a multitude of different ways. Element Girl is the exact same way. She's an elemental, but she can manipulate her body based on a multitude of different substances. And so she's a, she's a very strong character. The problem here is that she's also insane. And this is actually something that Jeff Johns sort of gives us here. What he says is that she, according to Thomas Wayne, is absolutely nuts. She's really Harley Quinn-esque in terms of her level of insanity. Not necessarily that she's going nuts and wanting to kill people, but in the sense that she seems to be, well, for all intents and purposes, be a socially awkward person. And the result here is that she, when, when the president sent his message out telling people that they need to band together, they need to fight together as a singular team, she took that literally to mean that, you know, she was going to be on a team with them. Now, they're not necessarily against it, and the reason why is because if they don't have Superman, they need whoever they can get. They need whoever they can rally to their side to fight against the forces of Aquaman and Wonder Woman. And so they basically end up bringing her along. But during this process, Barry Allen continues to have these, uh, these glimpses, I guess, reformations of his memories from the way they used to be to the way things are. And he's continuing to lose himself. And so again, Thomas Wayne has brought along a series of injections that will help Barry Allen to fight along or fight against these, you know, modifications to his memory. But again, this is just Jeff Johns telling us time is of the essence. And so what we do is we switch over back to the, uh, to the Shazam kids. And they're again, continuing to debate whether or not they should get involved. But in the end, the idea here is that once, you know, once Barry Allen, once Cyborg, once Batman, once Element Girl show up here, uh, they basically tell them, you guys have to do something. They are wildly powerful in terms of their abilities. But what, uh, what Barry Allen also does is he shows them who they are from his timeline and his reality. Billy Batson is the one kid who was Shazam. You know, not all the other kids that were there. It's simply just Billy Batson. More so than that, he had a Shazam family. In addition to that, he also fought Black Adam as one of his most notable villains. But at the same time, he was also an equal to Superman in terms of sheer strength, depending on what era of comics that we're talking about. But the legacy of Shazam, the legacy of Captain Marvel is a very rich one and a very powerful one. And in his reality, in Barry Allen's home reality, the main DC universe that we're used to, Shazam wouldn't have stood idly by if there was a way for him to save the world. He would have done what he needed to do when it needed to be done. And so what we do is we switch over to a news broadcast, which shows the fact that Hal Jordan has been killed in the nuclear explosion that we had talked about, where he is no longer, you know, part of the landscape. And this is a huge deal for Barry Allen because he didn't know where Hal Jordan was. He didn't know what was going on with Hal Jordan. But the fact remains that this is yet another casualty. And the case that they make here is that Hal Jordan was just a regular guy. He was a regular pilot willing to put his life on the line for the purpose of saving the world. The problem here is that Thomas Wayne doesn't necessarily agree with them. And Thomas Wayne makes the case that people, because of who they are, because of what they've done, they sort of deserve to die. He's willing to cast them aside. But in the eyes of Barry Allen, in the eyes of Cyborg, this is not okay. That everyone has to fight. That everyone has to do what they can to save the world. Because even when it seems like all hope is lost in the face of such overwhelming odds, even when it seems like there's nothing they can do, that they have to do something 
something. And so what happens is they grab the Shazam kids, they grab Thomas Wayne, they grab Element Girl, everybody they can find who's willing to fight, and they launch this sort of last ditch effort on the shores of New Themyscira. They launch this last ditch effort, you know, between the Atlanteans and the Amazons. And we have a full contingent of what we consider to be some of our most prominent heroes, some of our favorite heroes. But at the end, they're only able to do the best they can. They're only able to hold off things to a certain degree. Now with Shazam, something to point out here is that the forces of Wonder Woman and these, these guys didn't know that they were composed of kids. In their mind, Shazam was just a superhero. Now the last time that Wonder Woman and Shazam fought, Wonder Woman came out on top. But when Enchantress shows up, she says they're just kids playing as grown-ups. And so what she does is she forces Shazam to return back to his form of kids. And this shows us how cruel the Amazons can be when they turn their swords against Billy Batson as a child and they kill Billy. Now, the reason why this matters is because the Shazam kids cannot become Shazam if one of them is dead. And so while this happens, while Barry Allen is watching all these events unfold, while he's watching absolute calamity takes place, he's met by Eobard Thawne. And Eobard Thawne simply says, look what you did. But with that being said, we are going to, uh, actually, you know what? We're not going to bring this video to an end. <laughs> Uh, my editor Gordon is going to be a fantastic editor and he's going to put the other half of this story in here. So we're going to get to issue number five because I love cliffhangers, guys. You guys know I love cliffhangers, but I cannot, I cannot leave things. I cannot leave you guys like this. I can't leave you guys hanging with, with this. So, so what happens is with Eobarthon here and with forces of Wonder Woman and the forces of Aquaman and Cyborg and his forces all fighting one another, Jeff Johns begins to shift our focus. Our focus stops being on everything that's going on and it starts to become, it starts to focus on Barry Allen and Eobard Thawne. And this is why I say, this is like the continuation. This is the finale of Jeff John's run. This is where it all stops. You know, this is the end of his view on Barry Allen because this brings us the final conflict or at least what seems to be the final conflict between Eobard Thawne and Barry Allen. What happens is from Barry Allen's perspective, Eobard Thawne screwed up the world. Eobard Thawne messed everything up, but there's also a little more to this. For those of you guys who had read Flash Rebirth, and I don't mean the current one, I mean the one from when Barry Allen first reappeared in the DC landscape after having died in Crisis on Infinite Earths, a lot of retconning was done there. But at the end of that story, Eobard Thawne seemed to be stuck in the Speed Force. It seemed as though he was trapped there and there was no way he was going to be able to escape. What we're told is that over the course of his existence in the Speed Force, he was always trying to find a way out. And Barry Allen was the one who engineered that. What Eobard Thawne tells us is that Barry Allen himself was the one who had screwed up the past. That Barry Allen himself was the one that had changed everything. That because Barry Allen always had this desire to save his mother's life. That because Barry Allen always had the desire to save Nora that he had done that. He traveled into the past and he saved his mother's life. And when he did, he altered time. He altered reality. Now, because of the fact that there was no flash, there came a point in the history of society when people needed someone who was super fast, when they needed someone, when, when there was just a pivotal moment when Barry Allen was needed. And because he wasn't there, things just began to take a downward spiral uh, into absolute insanity, leading the universe to the way it is now. In addition to this, Eobard Thawne himself was quite literally anchored to Barry Allen. Because Eobard Thawne was obsessed with Barry Allen by virtue of the fact that Barry Allen was a Flash and Eobard Thawne went into the past to meet Barry Allen and ended up driving himself insane when he learned he became a villain, the two were tied together. You know, Barry Allen became a Flash, which led to Eobard Thawne, which led to Eobard Thawne traveling into the past and ensuring his legacy by influencing the events that would lead to Barry Allen becoming the Flash. But because of the fact that Eobard Thawne was stuck in the Speed Force at the end of the Flash Rebirth story. When Barry Allen went into the past and saved his mom's life, the ramifications, the changes in the timeline did not affect Eobard Thawne, which effectively freed him from being tied to Barry, because what this did is it created a paradox. If Barry Allen never became the Flash, then how could Eobard Thawne have come into existence? And so, because of this, Eobard Thawne was free to do what he wanted. He was free to, to, to travel throughout the multiverse, and he had done this the entire time. From the, from the point at which this new universe was created, this new universe came into existence, Thawne just began traveling around. Thawne just began going around and analyzing everything.
everything, looking at everything, and being slightly entertained by what was happening. Now, while Thomas Wayne does intervene, while Thomas Wayne does try to help Barry Allen as best he can, he's totally outmatched. He's nowhere near the speed that he needs in order to defeat Eobard Thawne. But what happens is that things end pretty quick. In truth, it's really just Eobard Thawne's gloating that costs him everything. This is really the downfall of, of Thawne. It's the fact that he allows himself to be so arrogant. It's the fact that he allows himself to get caught up in his successes that he doesn't even take the time to consider that he might fail. And so while he's gloating, while he's towering over Barry Allen, while he's making fun of him, while he's relishing in his success, Thomas Wayne sneaks up behind him and stabs him through the chest with a sword. Thus ends the legacy of Eobard Thawne. And so what happens here is while all these forces are fighting one another, the resistance shows in. Grifter makes his appearance known by fighting against, you know, the, the forces of, uh, of Aquaman and Wonder Woman and so on and so forth. But while all this happens, suddenly Superman makes his appearance known. Now, again, this is not the Superman that we're used to. This is not the Superman that we know, but he does have all the same power that he did. And the reason why is because when he took off, he basically just spent his time drinking in the energies of the sun, drinking in all that solar radiation. And so while he's not physically buff, he's every ounce as strong as we would expect him to be. And he shows it when he single-handedly takes out both Aquaman and Wonder Woman. Now, initially it seems as though he's on the verge of destroying them. He's going to wipe them out. But as things begin to change, as reality begins to reach a point whereby it seems like all life is going to destroy itself, Barry Allen comes to the realization that because he's the cause of this, because he's the one that screwed up reality, he has to go back in time and he has to change it. He literally has to go let his mother die. He has to let her go. And so Thomas Wayne gives him a letter to give to his son Bruce, assuming everything goes back to normal. And Barry Allen starts running as fast as he can to the point where he breaks the time stream. And when he gets back, when he goes, he ends up running into his mom, but he has to go back even further. And he basically keeps reliving all these different memories. Now he does visit her. He does tell her that he has to set things back to normal. He does tell her that he's going to have to let her go, that she'll die. And she says it's okay because she'll be with his father. But as he continues running, as he keeps running back as far as he can, he eventually encounters himself. He encounters him going back in time and saving his mother's life. And so I know it seems a little confusing. I know it seems a little weird, but this is where DC's reset. This is where DC's reboot comes into play when they launched the new 52. What they did is they basically introduce a character named Pandora. Now, we don't really need to go into her wildly, but what, what happened here is with the actions of Barry Allen, because he had gone back and changed the past, when he goes back a second time and allows his mother to die, this creates a whole new universe. And it basically just allowed DC to grab their Wildstorm, to grab their Vertigo, to grab their main DC timeline, to grab all these different versions of their characters and mold them into a singular reality, which gave birth to the creation of the new 52 timeline. And so what this does is this sets things back. It sets Barry back to the moment uh, when he first woke up. And of course, as he comes to, uh, he realizes that the Flashpoint universe had happened. He realizes everything that took place, but he also realizes that things are now back to normal. And so what he does is he races back to the uh, to the Batcave, to Bruce Wayne. And initially he's a little confused. He actually asks, are you Bruce Wayne? And Bruce says, yes, of course. And he gives Bruce, he tells him everything that happened and he gives him a letter to Bruce written from his father. And for the first time that I've ever seen in the history of DC Comics, Bruce Wayne actually cries because for him, this is a huge thing. To be able to have some measure of information from his father is a huge deal. But more so than that, because Barry had talked to Thomas Wayne while he was in that universe and told him what Bruce Wayne became, it was a way for Bruce Wayne to know that his father was proud of him, that his father was proud of everything he had done, everything he had accomplished, that he was able to restore normal. He was able to avenge them without killing people, without reverting to such a, a, a gruesome person the way that Thomas Wayne had done. And so anyway, that brings an end to the Flashpoint story. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this, let me know, because I got to tell you, Flashpoint is probably one of the best damn stories DC's had in a long time. Even now with DC Rebirth, Flashpoint still stands the test of time as one of the best stories I've ever done. But let me know what you guys think down in the comments section. Drop a like if you enjoyed this. And uh, yeah, I will catch you guys later. Peace.